Would you take your Bibles and turn with me first uh, to the book of Deuteronomy? We'll start there looking at a couple verses in Deuteronomy, and then we'll flip over to the main passage we'll look at in 1 Corinthians chapter 4. So Deuteronomy chapter 8, and we'll look at verses 17 and 18. Inside of your bulletin, you'll find an insert called uh, Faithful Stewardship. And this month, we'll look at stewardship and what it means to be faithful in our stewardship. Um, I like doing this at the beginning of the year, uh, each January. And uh, um, the first time that I did this, I remember how fearful I was. It's not easy to talk about stewardship. Some people think stewardship as only money. That's not what I view stewardship as. Stewardship is much more than just the money that God has entrusted to us. Uh, It is so much more, and we want to look at some of that throughout this month. Um, But I want to challenge you and encourage you as you think about stewardship. uh, Sometimes we think um, that we know it all or that we have it down. And, And one of my prayers is that God would open our hearts and our minds that we might be challenged in, in a new way, in a freshness, in, in maybe a different area than even what we uh, would have seen or would have prayed or thought about. Uh, as we dig in here, this, this idea of stewardship, um, each week for these next four weeks today and then three weeks after, um, each week I'll give you a word that we'll focus on. And this word, uh, the word of the day as Sesame Street used to have, the word of the day is, and today's word of the day is perspective. And that word is quite important. And when we look at perspective, um, it, it is something as easy as putting our glasses on, and now I can read the back, uh, whereas if I take them off, I cannot read the back. And so um, those of you who are in the back seats, I want to make sure that I can see you and see what you're doing um, so that if you fall asleep least I know it, all right? And I've always told people, if you're going to fall asleep, don't fight it, just go, okay? God knows that you need to rest more important than hurting your neck, okay? Whiplash. Um, Deuteronomy 8, there's a reminder here that God has for his people. And we get in the midst of how God has provided for them and, and supplied for the nation of Israel as he has delivered them out of the bondage in Egypt. And he gets to this place in verse 11. He says, don't forget the Lord. Don't forget uh, by not keeping his commandments. And then we jump down to verse 17. Um, uh, And I I want to jump back even a verse before that. Remembering that it was the Lord who fed you in the wilderness with manna that your fathers did not know that he might humble you and test you to do good in the end. And then verse 17, beware lest you say in your heart, my power and the might of my hand has gotten me this wealth. You shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth, that he may confirm his covenant that he swore to your fathers as it is this day. Perspective helps us to understand, and and the first part of this perspective, perspective equals an understanding that we are stewards, not owners. That we are stewards and not owners. With this, uh, we see God's reminder all throughout the scripture and even the passage that, Reth, that Seth read for us in Psalm 24, the fact that, that God owns it all. God made the world. He's the maker. He's the creator. And if that's true, then he is the owner. And so with that perspective... That helps us to understand um, and, and to start off, especially a new year, uh, with the proper perspective that we need. So take your Bibles now, and if you would, jump over to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, I want to lay down a little bit of foundation or background for you as we think about this um, and what Paul is going to say. Paul is writing to the church in Corinth in this first letter, and there has been some dissension. And some of that dissension has surrounded around the fact of who is their leader. And in chapter 1, uh, Paul combats some of that uh, with, with the argument that some are following or say that they are followers of Paul. Some are followers of Apollos or some Cephas or Peter as we know him. Um, 
but he reminds them that all of us are followers of Christ. What's interesting is he kind of leaves that argument and then he goes on and he talks about what Christ has done, Christ crucified, and the sacrifice that Christ made on our behalf. And then he talked about some of the divisions in the church in in chapter 3. But then he comes back to, in chapter 4, who he is. Who is Paul? Who is he that is writing this letter to the early church, to the early believers? And he isn't going to puff out his chest. In fact, he's going to quite, um, in a way, diminish the focus on him. Not not diminish who God has called him to be, but to diminish the thought of them elevating a person. And he's going to focus on who God is. And so I want to dig in, and I would like to read through the first 16 verses of 1 Corinthians 4, and then we'll go back and we'll kind of break it down as we go. So 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1. This is how one should regard us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found faithful. But with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by any human court. In fact, I do not even judge myself, for I am not aware of anything against myself, but I am not thereby acquitted. It is the Lord who judges me. Therefore, do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart, that each one will receive his commendation from God. I have applied all these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit, brothers, that you may learn by us not to go beyond what is written, that none of you may be puffed up in favor of one against another. For who sees anything different in you? What did you have? What do you have that you did not receive? If then you received it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it? Already you have all you want. Already you have become rich. Without us, you have become kings. And would that you did reign so that we might share the rule with you. For I think that For I think that God has exhibited us, apostles, as last of all, like men sentenced to death, because we have become a spectacle to the world, to angels, and to men. We are fools for Christ's sake, but you are wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are held in honor, but we in disrepute. To the present hour we hunger and thirst. We are poorly dressed and buffeted and homeless. And we labor, working with our own hands. When reviled, we bless. When persecuted, we endure. When slandered, we entreat. We have become and are still like the scum of the world, the refuse of all things. I do not write these things to make you ashamed, but to admonish you as my beloved children. For though you have countless guides in Christ, you do not have many fathers, For I became your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel. I urge you then, be imitators of me. Would you pray with me? Lord, we're thankful for the opportunity to open up your word. And I pray that as we open it up and as we've read it and as we dig in and uncover some of the truths of it, Lord, and how it applies to our life, I pray that you would help us to be good listeners, listeners of your spirit, Lord, so that when we walk out of here, we would be changed in different people seeking to honor you even above ourselves, Lord. We love you. Thank you for your word. I pray, Lord, that you would use me as your vessel. Lord, speak truth through me and help me to communicate clearly for your honor and for your glory. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Perspective. Perspective. Think about that. Twelve years ago, just a couple days ago, uh, twelve years ago on Friday... Uh, we had our second child, and uh, it's interesting to think back 12 years ago what life was like, and to have a three-year-old and to have a newborn. Um, my perspective was very limited in that moment. I remember feeling exhausted and tired and just worn out, but I also was overjoyed And I remember having my girls, and I remember each one of them just holding them and loving them and and wondering, what are they thinking when they smile, when they're just those little babies? What 
What's going on in their mind when they all of a sudden get that poochy lip that just sticks out as they're dreaming and thinking? Perspective makes us, uh, helps us to move and navigate life. And that's why uh, when I look in the mirror and I see gray, silver, old, uh, there is something that, that's, that's the truth about that, about navigating life and where the psalmist says that that gray upon the head is a crown of wisdom because you navigate, you, you, you gain perspective, you gain understanding, hopefully you gain wisdom. When we look at perspective of stewards, when we understand that God is the owner, he's the master, that I am just called a steward. We have to define that. What does that mean, a steward? A steward is one that, that has been given to. A steward is one that is not in ownership of, but has been given the rights to care for. And God has given us much as stewards to care for. As a husband, God has called me to be a faithful husband and to care for my wife, to love her, and to be a good steward of her and leading her. As a father, God has called me to be a good steward of the relationships that I have with my children, to love them, to nurture them, to care for them, to sometimes correct them, and sometimes correct them more. And then they help correct me. Perspective. Stewards were not owners. When we look at perspective, I, I'm fearful that in, especially in our American culture today, in the world that we live in today, I'm fearful that we as Christians have lost the proper perspective of stewardship. And I'm, I've been guilty of that too. Back a few years ago, I, I received a, a, a board game, and it was a game that was uh, for Christmas, so that was a, a game that was pretty expensive. I knew who the person who had bought it had invested quite a bit of money uh, for me to have that. And in, in having that game, uh, I wanted to take care of that. And so, um, needless to say, when we were at a family member's ho- home and uh, we were playing a different game, and I find the young children at that time uh, playing this game, um, I became concerned. And my concern went into uh, anger very quickly because I had realized that in their haste to try to clean up this game, they had ripped the board. And, uh, and I was not happy. And I had lost perspective. I lost perspective that I wasn't the owner. See, what happened was I, I yelled at my children and their cousins for not taking care of, not being good stewards of my game because it was mine. I was given that gift. And thankfully, I have a brother-in-law who later pulled me to the side and said, Aaron, I think you've lost perspective. And he didn't say it like that, but that's what he was telling me. It's only a game. We, unfortunately, have lost perspective in the fact that we have been given something so glorious and wonderful, and we've been given salvation, and God has entrusted to us various means of being able to live out a life that would reflect that gospel and reflect his love. But we've lost perspective in the fact that we have come along and we feel that we own those items. Now again, I'm not saying that we shouldn't be good stewards and taking care of the things God has given us. I think we should shoot to do things with excellence, and that shows the greatness and the goodness of our God. But let me encourage you that, that maybe this morning you need to ask God to help bring back a proper perspective of what a steward of God looks like. And so let's look, dig in here, and if you have your sheet before you, uh, we're going to walk through that. Uh, 
perspective really, as I looked through this passage and as I read and studied some other passages, I think it does two things for us, two main things. And number one, perspective gives us freedom. Perspective gives us freedom uh, in the fact that, that as we see um, that God is the owner and that I am just his steward, it gives me a freedom in these three ways. Number one, a freedom of release. Uh, it's a freedom to understand that it's, it's all God's. All of it is God's. Um, you know, when, when Paul is writing here in 1 Corinthians 4, the first, uh, the first five verses, he, he's reminding them of, of not necessarily of just who they are, but of who God is. This is how one should regard us as servants of Christ or bond servants, a bond slave, one who has chosen to be enslaved to God is the best definition there. A bond servant is one who could have been free to do his own thing, but has chosen, as a bond servant, has chosen to been pierced by his, ma- his master or her master with an earring to say, I am their property and I'm choosing to be underneath them. Paul is saying we are are chosen by God, but we are choosing to follow God and to be his servants. That's who we are. And he says, we are servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. There are a few different definitions of, of mysteries that, that we won't go into here this morning, but as the New Testament defines what are some of these mysteries of God, I, I would argue and say that one of the greatest mysteries of God is the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's a mystery to those who don't know it, who haven't accepted it. To us who have accepted eternal life through Jesus Christ, we understand what that mystery is. It's a mystery that, that God would send his son and that he would die for us in our place, that, that the God and maker of the universe would come and die for you and me. That just doesn't make sense for those of us who have trusted Christ as our Savior. That mystery is no longer a mystery. We accept that by faith and we understand that. There is also the mystery of the church. Paul talks about that in his letters to the church in Corinth. It is a mystery. Why? Because, think about it, the church is new at that time. The church is is something brand new that God is working in an organism that he started through Christ Jesus as the chief cornerstone and that he is going to spread the gospel through the church. Israel was his and is his chosen people. And during this church age, God chose as a mystery to all the people before, that he was going to work in a group of believers, Jews, Gentiles, all nations, for those who will trust Christ as their Savior, God would bring them together and this living organism would go out and proclaim hope to the world. Paul says that we are servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. He says it is required of stewards that they be found faithful. That's our verse of the month. That as we dig in and as we try to memorize scripture, I think this is a, a great passage for us. Verse 2, moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found faithful. Hence why I titled this series, Faithful Stewardship. That one day when we stand before God as followers of Christ, that God would be able to say to you and me, well done, good and faithful servant, son, child of mine. Perspective gives us freedom, and that freedom of release, understanding that it's all God's. And Paul goes on and he says, listen, you don't, you don't have the right to judge me verses 3 through 5, and I don't even have the right to judge myself. What I've been given has been given by God. And because God has given me these mysteries, you don't have the right to judge me. See, freedom of release gives us this this freedom to be able to say, and exhale. It's kind of like that board game. With the proper perspective, I can say, you know what? The Lord entrusted that to me. And I can use this as a teaching time to help my children understand 
that we probably need to take our time when we put things away and let's treat things well and let's do it well instead of having the false perspective and getting upset and yelling and screaming and getting mad because I owned it. You understand the difference? There's a release. There's a freedom that says, God, it's yours. It's kind of like that when you, if you've ever been in an accident. Have you ever been in an accident before in your car? Uh, when I got rear-ended this last year, there, there was this first overwhelming sense of thankfulness that I was alive. And second, that, that oh man, my poor van. And the more I thought about it, the more depressed I got, knowing that that 2002 van was, that had close to 300,000 miles, I, I was not going to see any dollar amount that equated what the value was to our family. There was a loss of perspective. There was a, a, a need, a desire to hold on to that. In reality, as I worked through that and God challenged and worked in my heart and my mind, the realization to understand that, you know what? God gave us that van. And if God gave that van, he can take it away. And, and as God entrusts us as stewardship, as stewards, we need to have the proper perspective that says, God, it's yours. And if you give it to me, I, I want to use it. But if you take it away, I want to praise you and I want to thank you for that. It's much like what I say to parents when we've gone through child dedication, parent dedication. As parents, we want to hold on to our kids and we want to love them and care for them. But I want you to know that the reality is, is that we don't own our children. Rick told me this morning, he said, you know what next year is at this time? I said, no, what's next year? You're going to have two teenagers. I'm like, thanks, Rick. <laughs> you know, I can try to push them down. I can try to subdue my children and keep them young but the reality is they're growing up and I can't keep them from growing up and the reality is I can't I can't have the sense and the determination to say they're mine the reality is God has given and entrusted me three beautiful children and I love them very much but the reality is they are not mine I don't own them they are God's Everything that you and I have that we enjoy is God's. And when we have the proper perspective that God owns it all, man, that gives us freedom. Freedom of release. Not that we don't care about the things, but that we can continually release them back to God. That they don't overpower us. There's also a freedom to disperse. Pause. This whole passage, he's talking about the importance of him coming and sharing the gospel. He has come as Apollos has. And they can judge him. They can choose to select whoever they want to follow. But he is saying, listen, I have sacrificed so that you can hear the gospel. So that you can be grounded and as my children know and understand what the gospel message is. The freedom to disperse. To love God and love others. Ultimately, all that you and I have has been given to us for God's glory. To display the beauty of our God. Have you ever thought about that? Have you ever thought about everything that you have has been given to you so that God will get glory? And so that the gospel message could be proclaimed in your life. That gives us the freedom to say, you know what? Here, I'm going to keep my hands open, not clutching, not holding on to what God has entrusted me, but to open it so that God can use those items and use those things to reach others so that he would be glorified. Freedom also of contentment. Perspective gives us freedom of contentment. Looking and realizing all that I have, not all that I want, or all that I think I need, when we have the proper perspective, it gives us the freedom to say, man, look at all that I have. When was the last time you just sat quietly and you thought about all that God has entrusted to you? 
and you praised him and you thanked him. We have been given so much and yet we are fed lies that tell us we need more. Paul in his explanation verses 6 through 13 it's amazing as he talks about the apostles. And, and I just wonder, could this be said of you and I? I think God has exhibited us apostles as last of all, like men sentenced to death. Because we have become a spectacle to the world, to angels and to men. We are fools for Christ's sake. We are weak. We are in disrepute. We hunger and we thirst. We're poorly dressed. We're buffeted and homeless. We labor, working with our hands. We're reviled. We're persecuted. We're slandered. We have become and are still like the scum of the world the refuse of all things. Paul says in the book of Philippians how he has become content in all things. He can be thankful in all things. I look at our life, my life, and I look at what Paul and the apostles went through. Is there any comparison Is there contentment in your heart and in your mind? Is there a willingness to give as Paul gave? Paul makes it very clear. He doesn't write these things to make them feel ashamed. And I don't read those to make you feel ashamed. But to admonish. To encourage us. That where God has you and I, where he has entrusted to us the things that we enjoy, the time, the energy, the money, the resources, the gifts, the abilities, all that he's given us, admonishing you to have the proper perspective. Because perspective also gives us purpose. Purpose to do what the master desires. Remember, if we don't own it, somebody does. Who owns it? God does, right? And if God owns it, we better do what the master wants. And so, how do we do that? That's why we dig into the word every day. That's why we pray and we ask the Lord for guidance and wisdom where we trust that the Spirit will lead us and we listen to the Spirit as He guides us, that we navigate through life doing what God desires, not what I want, because I'm not the owner. I don't own my life. I've given it away. God owns my life. Does He own yours? If He does... Perspective gives us purpose to do what the master desires. Purpose also to make an impact. Perspective gives us purpose to make an impact. I think back to Paul, and as he's writing all of this, ultimately he he says, "I, I didn't write these things to make you ashamed, but to admonish you as my beloved children. For though you have countless guides in Christ, those who have helped navigate you, and are helping you grow, um, you do not have many fathers. For I became your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Paul is saying, listen, I I am I have been the one, I've I'm the one who's come and shared the gospel with you. Understand this impact and, and be imitators of me and continue to have that impact out there. I think back to my Sunday school teacher who led me to Christ. And I had lots of different people who helped navigate me in my life. And my parents were a huge part of that. But I'm so thankful for Mrs. Massey, 
who that day in Sunday school class shared the gospel with me and prayed with me, and I trusted Christ as my Savior. That's a special bond that I'll have with Mrs. Massey for all of eternity. I, I don't know where Mrs. Massey is. I haven't talked to her in, in probably 30, 35 years. I do know this, that God used Mrs. Massey in my life to make an impact. And I'm asking you to have a perspective that says, I don't own anything that I have. God has entrusted it to me, and I want to use it for his glory so that God may be glorified and ultimately so people are impacted by the gospel of Jesus Christ. Mrs. Massey could have said, no, I'm tired of teaching Sunday school. She could have said, you know, I'm not going to study anymore. I'm not going to pray anymore. I'm not going to give my time anymore. But because Mrs. Massey was faithful, she was a faithful steward of what God had entrusted to her, she not only made an impact on my life, but how many other countless young people. And then us, as being impacted by her, have impacted so many others. And it continues to go. God, in his great love, has called us to be his stewards. What a great responsibility that is. And I believe the first step of being a faithful steward is having the right perspective. God owns it all. And he's worthy for us to be able to use it all for his glory. Will you pray with me, Lord? Thanks for the opportunity to open up your word this morning. And I pray, Lord, that as we respond to your word this morning, that with your help, Lord, we would, we would uh, commit to, to cease clinging to the things that are so temporary here to the things that will be either passed on, thrown away, or will fade away. Lord, I pray that we would be people who would cling to the hope of Jesus Christ. And that as your bond servants and as your stewards, you would give us and help us to retain a proper perspective of all that you've entrusted to us. Help us to cling to Christ, knowing that he is all that we need. And that all the things that you have, have, have joyously entrusted to us, Lord, they are secondary compared to Christ. Lord, my prayer for those who sit here today who have not yet accepted Christ, Lord, my prayer is that today... Today, they would trust Christ as their Savior. They would ask the forgiveness of their sins so that they would become your child and experience eternal life, a life that is greater than anything this world has to offer. Thank you for those who have given their life to Christ. And I pray, Lord, that you would renew us, empower us, Help us to be recharged with a proper perspective that you, God, have entrusted so much to us and help us to use it for your glory. Help us not to retain it as owners, but to disperse, to be content, and to give you glory. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for the way you care for us. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.